Video games, we all love them, but let's face it, some types of games are just better than others. And some of you guys are just wrong. And who better to tell you, the viewer, what the best and worst types of games are than me, some random guy on the internet who doesn't even show his face. I've spent the past couple weeks compiling all the game genres I could find, determining if they're too niche for the list or if they need to be broken down into different categories. And now finally, we have a tier list that I've made public for everyone at home too. If you're interested in making your own tier list, just look up Dagger's Video Game Tier List 3.0 or just use the link in the description and tweet your results at me. Who knows? I might even respond. And before we get it started, let me explain some very basic rules. When we're talking about these games, we are excluding the bad games from each category. Now why, you may ask? Well, bad games exist in every single genre. Bad developers make bad games, it's just a constant. But when it comes to the upper echelon of games, and especially the average, the genre can make a huge difference in how a game is perceived. If two horrible developers make two different games in two different genres, there's a good chance I'm going to hate them both. But if two average developers make two different games in two different genres, there's a very good chance that I'm going to like one substantially more than the other. So with that being said for this tier list, and if you're making your own tier list, this is only talking about the average and above average games in each genre. But without further ado folks, let's hop into it and get started. Let's start with an oldie but a goodie as some people say, platformers. Platformers back in the day used to be the most prominent genre of games, but these days they've just become a relic of gaming's past. But a few devs out there do still keep it going. When talking about the medium itself, a platformer is very distinct in that you're pressing literally one button for 90% of your playthrough. Platformers are of course always centered around the idea of jumping, but why you're doing this can vary. I heavily considered separating collectathons from platformers since there's such a large difference in the general approaches to these games. Platformers are usually a bit linear, and a collectathon is almost a 3D open environment. And I might say different in the future, but as of right now, I would just say that collectathons are a subgenre of platformers. But especially when you're including those games, think about the absolutely insane amount of recognizable names in the platformer category Mario, Spyro, Crash, Banjo, Celeste, Psychonauts. Platformers have been some of the most influential games of all time, but I will say it does have a few flaws. Laws. It's incredibly hard to make a game like this have a somewhat gripping narrative. This is the one avenue where these games really start to fall behind. Mario has a non-existent story, Crash and Spyro always have the most basic brain-dead plots. 90% of platformers can be summed up as bad guy shows up and we need to stop him. The one platformer that I think killed the narrative part is Celeste, but that's definitely an exception to the rule. But for all of these reasons, if you're putting platforming anywhere below an A tier, the only platforming you're doing are mental gymnastics, and I hope you platform your way off a building in real life. Next up, we have an absolute staple of the gaming community with survival games. Now, survival games have conceptually been around for a very, very long time, but when someone brings it up, you're thinking about games like The Long Dark, Minecraft, Ark, Subnautica, all that kind of stuff. Modern survival games are extremely versatile and have some of the most incredible replay value out of any genre I can name. The core components of a survival game are a food bar, sometimes a water bar, a building system, harvestable resources, and usually some sort of creatures you're meant to survive against. And if you're a miner, you're going to be surviving against the 200 pet of Minecraft YouTubers. But if you think about all the games I listed just a second ago, they are so radically different from each other, and that's because survival survival games just lend themselves so unbelievably damn well to anything. However, the infinite possibilities also allow the game genre to get very lazy. Games like Ark and Minecraft put out a proportionally pathetic amount of content, and as a result, I can't put this genre anywhere above a solid B tier. And this is an excellent baseline genre just to judge things off of. Alright, next up is a truly niche genre these days, which are rhythm games. Most people like myself have their main experience with these games through Guitar Hero, a currently very dead franchise, but I never really got why that is. Yes, some other games heavily inspired by Guitar Hero still exist today, but I really think a mainline Guitar Hero game would fucking kill it. But that's besides the point. As nostalgic as rhythm games are for me, it's one of the most limiting genres on the market. There's really not a whole lot you can do with rhythm games. Most rhythm games rely on repetitive gameplay loops, with the main distinction being the different songs that you're playing. Meaning, in my opinion, these games lack a lot of replay value. But these games definitely aren't the worst, so C tier. But hold on folks, this video is sponsored by no one else but me, pussy. This is a call out to all fellow YouTubers, streamers, and content creators. I want you to take this tier list and make your own video ranking the genres or or even a video critiquing my list. I want this to turn into a community conversation so we can see how other people feel about the different genres. I feel like it'll be a very interesting experiment, so if you got a YouTube channel or anything like it, get on that shit, and make sure you tweet your videos at me. Next up viewers, time to give back a little bit. Some of you guys in the comments crack me the fuck up, and I want to give a shout out to the funniest comment I see in each video. Starting with this guy, who in my video about gatekeeping proceeded to gatekeep my video in the comments. I'm serious, this, <laughs> this fucking killed me, dude. And if you at home think you got something funny to say, leave it in the comments. I seriously read most of these. Anyway, enough yapping, back to the video. Next up, an absolute least favorite of mine, MOBAs. Now, let me be clear. Oh, shit, I sound like Obama. Let, let me, me be clear. clear. I genuinely dislike MOBAs conceptually. I hate the way they look, the way they play. It just isn't for me. I find them miserable. In my opinion, there isn't much value for casual players. Everyone expects you to be a god and take everything seriously like it's an esports match, which technically isn't an issue with the games themselves, but I still find that every MOBA is like this. But as much as I hate them, there is something to say for their longevity in competitive scenes. Just checking right now, 
now, Dota has over 500,000 active players, and this is a decade-old game. League of Legends released in 2009 and has had a competitive scene for well over a decade, and Dota's the same way. If these games have the ability to survive for over a decade and still be relevant, then even though I detest them, the lowest I can place these is a B tier. But for the record, I think MOBAs are dog shit. Next up is one of my most played genres, fighting games. Fighting games will always hold a very special place in my heart. These are the games that got me into the mindset with being okay with losing if it means making progress. And to this day, it's the only competitive scene I will ever sit down and keep up with. When just talking about the medium itself, there's a bunch of positive shit to say about fighting games. These are almost 100% of the time one-on-one -on -one games, meaning there's no excuses, it's just you and the other guy. Most fighting games have extremely charismatic and recognizable characters. And on top of that, these games usually have amazing customization and realistically infinite replay value. But these games also manage to do something incredibly rare, which is appealing both to competitive players and complete casuals. If you want to have fun with these games, just get a bunch of friends over, get a few drinks, and sit around playing Tekken. It's one of the most fun experiences I've ever had with gaming in general, and it's half of how these games are intended to be played. But there are definitely some notable cons. For starters, poor balance can absolutely ruin a fighting game for people like myself, admittedly. For example, I love Tekken 8 so unbelievably much, but anytime I see a Dragunov, Jun, or Xiaoyu, I just get really sad. Secondly, the medium is not exactly well suited to any form of storytelling. I find that fighting game story modes are typically very underwhelming and usually over the top, and I'll even throw Tekken and Mortal Kombat under the bus with that. It's just really damn hard to tell a compelling story in a fighting game, but with all of that said, fighting games earn a very respectable A tier. Roguelikes. Yet another A tier. For the longest time, I was extremely skeptical of roguelikes. I didn't really like the idea of having to rerun the same basic areas, but then I got into two different games that really changed my mind. The first game I tried was Dead Cells, which is a fucking masterpiece. I love that most roguelikes feel more like AA games as opposed to a flashy AAA title, and these games typically tend to have simpler graphics, meaning they can even run on the Switch, which honestly is a, an achievement in and of itself. And on top of that, since the graphics are so simple, all of the effort is solely put into the gameplay and storytelling, which brings me straight into yet another another 10 out of 10 game, Hades. I made the horrible mistake of sleeping on Hades for damn near two years, and for those of you who have never gotten around to playing it, it is legitimately almost flawless. My only complaint is that sometimes the gameplay is far too centered around repetitive combat and grinding materials. That's it. I have no idea if roguelikes as a genre are just flawless, or maybe the devs who make them are just so passionate about what they do that all the games that are made in the genre are just perfect. But regardless, I absolutely adore them, and they're well deserving of a spot right below the top. And if you disagree, why don't you drop a rogue like on the video. God, that choke was shit. Next up, open world games. One of the most broad genres out there. Now, when I'm talking about open world games, I'm thinking about games that most of what you're doing is just walking around with no obligation to do anything and just choosing quests at your own leisure. As a medium, I literally don't think it gets better than open world games, making this our first S tier ranked genre. I definitely get that certain people dislike the idea of an open world game. Many devs use them to make very empty, boring games. But kind of like I said in the beginning, lazy devs make bad games, and that's just a constant throughout the entire industry. But when you make a good open world game, you make some of the best games ever. Skyrim, GTA 5, hopefully GTA 6, Red Dead 1, Red Dead 2, Breath of the Wild, legitimately some of the highest quality games ever are all open world titles. Don't get me wrong, for every one Skyrim there's a mediocre cyberpunk, but in my opinion, sometimes the medium can carry those games anyway. The ability to just wander around a handcrafted world is something a lot of games just don't offer, and in my eyes, if it's done right, this is an absolute S-tier genre. But from one of the best to one of the absolute worst genres of all time, we're going to talk about what truly is just a glorified casino, gotcha games. Prior to making this video, never once in my life have I ever played a gotcha game, which you know, is a pretty fucking normal thing to have not done, but I would feel very disingenuous ranking something without never actually trying it. So for the sake of this video, folks, I took the plunge. I did this for you out there, listener. And I'm both very happy and extremely sad to report that for those of you who have never played a gacha game, uh, you didn't miss shit. 90% of these gacha games seriously have absolutely no base. It's just a digital collection book with a very teensy bit of story. But remember, we're only looking at the average and above average titles. So let's look at Genshin or Honkai Star Rail, two games that at a base level at least have gameplay mechanics. So Genshin is this open world RPG, I guess? I guess in terms of graphics, it's, it's actually not too bad. And you know, same thing with Honkai Star Rail. I enjoy the anime aesthetic. I, I think it can be done pretty well. There's actually stuff to do. Ah, uh, but okay, here we go. This is what most people are doing with their time. Gambling, baby! And look, it's not for me, but I can see that somewhere in all of these slot machines, there's a game mixed in there somehow by accident, and it's not great. This is very standard combat for an RPG. Nothing stand out, but I guess it's passable. And look, you know I love gambling, right? <laughs> I love gambling a lot. Uh, but this isn't uh, how you should do it. 
And uh, for that reason, D tier for don't gamble on fictional women. Sports games. Another just legitimately awful genre of video games. Madden hasn't been good in like probably a decade now. NBA 2K is trash. These games just fucking suck. And I won't hear any piece of defense either. 60 bucks a year to keep playing the most recent version of this trash is just ridiculous. And on top of that, the two games I mentioned are notoriously pay to win. In a completely casual setting, I do love these games. They can be a ton of fun. But taking these games online into things like Ultimate Team where the player cards get released through the year is the biggest scam of all time. All they do are make a few cards, put them into limited time packs, and people pay hundreds of dollars gambling for a card that will be worth nothing in two months. And half the gameplay mechanics are luck too. D tier again. Stop paying for these. Vote with your wallet, people. Next up is an absolute classic and a controversial category of games. The horror genre. I I'm actually realizing that I have a slight accent when I say the word horror. I say horror. I do not pronounce both R's. Um... Give me a minute, I'm gonna go have like a breakdown about this, I'll be right back. When I was deciding on the rules for this tier list, this category was the most influential on my decision to exclude bad games. Horror games are legitimately some of the worst games I've ever played. In fact, I made a whole video on that. Good wording, it's a bit outdated by my current standards, but that's irrelevant. I am in the nest of the Jews. They have cleverly shifted their shapes. One of them has taken the form of a little old woman. The scariest part of half of the horror games out there is realizing that you spend a finite amount of your time on this earth playing them that you will never get back. And when I die and I have my life flash before my eyes, half of it's gonna be me playing Granny 3. But it is worth saying, over the years I've been made aware of the fact that some horror games are legitimately some of my favorite games ever. Meaning at a glance, I have no idea what to do with this. Sure there's a thousand generic Steam horror games where a scary creature chases you while you look for seven pages, but there's also games like Silent Hill 2, games like Resident Evil 2 and 4, Alien Isolation, and I think it would be absolutely insane to put this as a below average genre with games like this being out there. So as a medium, I think horror games are a bit of a blank canvas. If a game has a great story to tell, horror tends to be a compelling way to do it, keeping you truly on edge. But if done sloppily, horror games are just terrible. So unfortunately, as much as I love them, horror games as a genre are just average. Next up, romance games, the most degenerate shit I've ever seen in my entire life. Romance games are just conceptually just so awkward to talk about. I don't even want to draw attention to these games, but if you've ever gone on Steam and clicked on the sales category, you have probably seen some absolutely diabolical shit. The fact that Steam allows a game called Sex with Hitler in its library is, um, just insane. But anyway, I've only ever played one of these games, and it was for a video on weird Steam games. And the game I played was Doki Doki Literature Club, a game that I actually have quite a bit of respect for. So it might indicate that the genre itself has some potential, but I refuse to even give it that credit. But you know what? I'm lying. I actually do have one romance game downloaded to my phone. And uh, if you're interested in it, it's called um, Tinder, you fucking loser. Play a romance game in real life, with real people. D tier. Battle Royales, one of the weirdest crazes in gaming to reflect on. There was a point where these games were sorta of niche, and then all of a sudden they were just everywhere. And I completely blame Fortnite for Titanfall getting converted to a Battle Royale. Nowadays COD has Warzone, and does anyone remember Blackout, dude? That game fucking sucked. These days the remaining big players in the BR genre are Fortnite, Warzone, Apex, and PUBG. And to be fair, they don't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. But my infatuation with the genre has more or less faded out. From the perspective of someone who doesn't play battle royales all the time, the idea of them just kinda sucks now. Matches can take forever, the gameplay loop can become repetitive, and every battle royale runs on that stupid system of seasons and battle passes, something that I think today hurts them. B tier. Next up, Kart Racers. B tier. Crash Team Racing is one of my favorite games ever. As a kid, I probably beat the game over a hundred times, but that's really the only kart racer I enjoy. There aren't any kart racers off the top of my head with the same skill cap and hidden mechanics. Mario Kart 8 actually used to be up there with like fire hopping and shit like that, but they just removed it, so now it's just kinda eh. Kart racers typically have an abysmal story and a repetitive gameplay loop, but if done properly like CTR Nitro Fueled, I do think some legitimately amazing titles can come out of it, warranting its middle of the road ranking. Simulators, a really weird genre out there that's becoming increasingly popular. I'm sure you've all seen these crazy truck driver setups and race car setups and it's kind of evolving into this really interesting subset of gaming, but I really don't like the idea of playing a game to simulate the real world, because to me a game is kind of an escape from reality to begin with. But then again, there are a few things I'd never ever want to get a license to do in real life which I guess is kind of the appeal of these games. And you know, people drunk driving on Truck Simulator make for some of the funniest videos I've ever seen in my entire life, so for that reason alone, I'll put it in a C tier. And while we're aboard the mid-train, we got City Builders, another one of the most overrated genres ever. City Skylines and SimCity are seriously just okay enough to be games, and for some reason people just eat this shit up. I mean, look, don't get me wrong, watching a city get leveled is, like, somewhat entertaining in a weird, sick, sadistic way, but is that enough to justify playing them? I don't 
think so. Trying to play these games is a constant balance of resources, expansion, and appeasing the public, and then rinse and repeat. Not horrible games, just not for me. Another C tier. Oh, and I kind of forgot. There's like an interesting subset of city builders, which is like RimWorld and Oxygen not included. Yeah, these these games are good. I don't really know what to call them. RPGs. Yes, finally. RPGs as a genre have the same level of legacy as platformers do, but where those games had a sudden sharp decline, RPGs are still one of the most prominent games out there. As of the time I'm writing this video, the second part of Final Fantasy VII hasn't quite dropped yet, but the early critic reviews place it around a 93, meaning that Final Fantasy alone has been making nearly flawless games of the genre for nearly three decades. RPGs are even so popular that there's an entire genre of anime that take place in settings with RPG elements and rules. It's wild. RPGs are a genre that you could argue in being far too general with. There are JRPGs, computer RPGs, and probably 10 other subgenres, but in my eyes, they aren't distinct enough to be worth separating. So when we just take a very quick look at the catalog of RPGs, you have Final Fantasy, which you could go back and forth on which one to bring up. I think 7's my favorite. Chrono Trigger, one of the highest rated games ever. Kingdom Hearts, fucking Baldur's Gate 3, Persona 5, Pokemon, Fire Emblem, Dragon's Quest. And even though there's some similarity between the games, I still think the genre lends itself to any style of game out there. And for that reason, in my opinion, it is the undisputed number one video game genre that I doubt will ever get replaced. S tier. Next up, yet another absolute classic, action-adventure games, which I feel the need to sit down and explain exactly what these games are. An action-adventure game more often than not contains elements of other genres, but these games more often than not prioritize story, exploration, or as the name might indicate, adventure. Think about something like Uncharted or The Last of Us, for example. Two games that are technically third-person shooters, but I think we all know that's not the main appeal of the game. This is sort of a miscellaneous category of games in my eyes. I can't really place my finger on what exactly defines an action-adventure game, further than explorable environments and a story, but damn it, I know one when I see one. For example, the old God of War games are hack and slash titles, but the new ones are most definitely action adventure. And to me, this is a genre that does absolutely nothing to carry the games. It is a blank canvas. These games tend to be heavily story driven, and thus in my opinion, the gameplay with these games usually isn't even that important. I don't even really care all too much for Uncharted or even The Last of Us from a purely gameplay perspective, but the medium allows those games to create such a perfect environment for a story. I will be perfectly transparent, I don't really know how to rank these, so I'm just gonna go off the ridiculous catalog of games and just rank it at a very respectable A tier. Strategy games, yet another very hard to play genre. You might notice that strategy's cousin series RTS games are also here, so let me distinguish them very quickly. Some strategy games are turn-based, and the other is just like a real-world battle where two sides go at once. But there are a few hybrid series. Total War, for example, is the perfect hybrid between RTS and turn-based strategy. You have the main map where most of your strategy takes place, and then RTS battles where tactical knowledge can be used to win very high-stakes battles. But in general, I actually heavily prefer turn-based strategy games like chess over RTS games as a whole, and it's not due to the quality of the games, but in general, RTS games are very fucking stressful. Watch this dude play StarCraft. Does this look relaxing to anyone? I'd much rather take time to prepare a perfect strategy and execute it rather than micromanage a bunch of troops. But that's why when I play Total War, I honestly use Auto Resolve to save time and just keep with the giant campaign map because to me that is honestly just way more fun. Strategy games can range from a single battle like chess to a grand scale campaign, building empires, alliances, all of that stuff. And to the contrary, most RTS games are typically limited to one battle and heavily cater towards an esports setting. So as a result, RTS RTS games get thrown in C tier, strategy games earn an A tier. And if you disagree, I advise you play a Total War game. Third Person Shooters. Now remember, this only includes games where shooting is the main focus. Games like The Last of Us don't count. We're talking Gears of War, Splatoon, all that sort of stuff. These games, I think, honestly work just fine. But recently, they have drastically fallen out of the public eye. Gears 5 marked the true fall of that series. And to be honest, I don't think anyone ever really took Splatoon that seriously. Now, I think this genre is extremely versatile. And two games that I think prove this very well are Tom Clancy's The Division, and then of course Star Wars Battlefront 2, which you know, really isn't a horrible game these days. And even in a competitive setting, I think third person shooters can be done extremely well. Exhibit A is naturally Gears of War, arguably the biggest third person shooter series ever made. In its glory days, some people would even argue it was better than COD, but look, I'm not at all an expert in third person shooters, but I'm just gonna take a chance here and throw it in B tier. If I'm completely dead wrong on these, um, I'm sure this is one I'm gonna regret. Moving on to party games, yet another true staple of the casual gaming community. Party games are usually a ton of fun provided you aren't stupid like me and decide to take Mario Party seriously. These games, as the title might allude to, aren't at all made to play alone, but instead either online or in person with a group of friends. And this is where these games are just unparalleled. Most party games manage to be fun for people of all ages, and they just leave so much room for chaos that it's sure to get a reaction out of everybody. Once again, I recommend alcohol for my adult viewers. Drunk Mario Party and Cards Against Humanity leads to a hell of a night, I'm not gonna lie. But I do have to say, these aren't anyone's go-to games for day-to-day -day use. Party games' lack of consistency is fun in most casual settings, but like 
like I said, it's pretty hard in my opinion to play these games by yourself and have fun. And let's be real here, you don't have friends. Half of you watching this can't even play these games. C tier. Next up are MMOs, yet another genre I'm just not a big fan of. These are typically a time period thing and you'll notice that 90% of the player base for like World of Warcraft or RuneScape tend to be people who played it as a kid and are now falling victim to the sunk cost fallacy. MMOs are grindy as fuck and usually without a ton of payout in my eyes. But look, I do see some redeemable merit. On paper, an MMO is realistically the best genre out there. I mean, look at the shit people do on EVE Online. People mine resources, build fleets, form armies, alliances, backstab, grab power, all in a video game. It's an incredible idea. But in practice, making a perfect MMO would be so unbelievably expensive that no one's willing to do it. And as a result, the games we have in this genre right now are just kind of below average, so C tier for me. Hack and slash games, which also just for shits and giggles includes beat em ups, because in my head they're honestly kind of the same thing. Hack and slash games honestly range from very very good to very mediocre and everywhere in between. God of War 2 and 3, Bayonetta, Devil May Cry, there are just so many great games here. But conceptually, these games just sort of fall flat in my opinion. There's a pretty set formula, you walk into a room, the door locks behind you, battle music plays and usually fight a wave of shitty enemies with one or two decent ones thrown in there, and typically rinse and repeat until you find a boss. I find the combat systems in these games to be fun on a first playthrough, but never something I'm inherently drawn to. Getting a bigger combo or a better letter on the side of your screen is cool and all, but in my opinion, not at all rewarding enough to justify learning this system. And really quickly, let me go off track and show you a little behind the scenes. To research each game genre and make sure I didn't miss anything, I usually googled like Metacritic's top 10 games in each genre, and Game Rant, the game journalism site, is uh, so unbelievably dog shit. Like, look at this. Kingdom Hearts listed as a hack and slash. Uh, according to, um, fucking who? Bro, look, it even says right here, holy shit, man, action RPG. How did you mess up that badly? You know what, let's go further down. Oh, God of War 1, right? You know, that's a fair take, but, um, uh, look at that screenshot. Uh, that is sure as hell not a screenshot from uh, God of War 1. Did anyone look over this article? But anyway, I don't really like the format of hack and slash games. But if made with enough love, they're some of the flashiest, most popular games ever, so solid A tier. Somebody call a doctor? <laughs> Next up, a favorite genre of many competitive gamers, tactical shooters. Games like CS and Valorant are absolute staples of the non-showering community, and honestly, if someone tells me Valorant's their favorite game, I'd just like walk away mid-conversation. But there is a ton of fun to be had with these games. Rainbow Six Siege, for example, back in the day was one of the reasons I bought a PC to begin with, and these games' key traits are honestly pretty cool. Most of these games often feature a one-shot headshot kill, meaning that precision in these games is everything. Secondly, there's almost always an offense and defensive team with an objective. So some sort of planable bomb, that sort of thing. The consistency of these games allow it to become hyper-competitive in tournament staples. I would personally go as far to say that over half of the community for these games are trying to play it and watch it in competitive settings. Even though, in my opinion, a good portion of pro matches are some of the most boring content in the fucking world. So even though I partially hate these games because I'm just honestly terrible at them, and I do dislike the casual options for these games, I cannot help but give them a very respectable B-tier placement. Now second to last tier, we got ourselves first-person shooters. Everything I said about third-person shooters also applies here. This category is for games mainly centered around gunplay in the first person, but these games are another example of a major fall from grace. Ten years ago, I would have without a doubt put these in the A tier, but FPS games ten years ago were the main genre gaming was focused on, and also ten years ago I'm pretty sure I didn't even have object permanence, so I really wouldn't take anything I said then seriously. I don't know if these games were ever as good as I remember them being, but nowadays I see these games for what they truly are, just super mediocre carbon copies with very little distinction. Call of Duty being allowed to persist as the dog shit annually release series that it is just like, should it happen ever? And to be honest, Call of Duty is kind of what drags the genre down these days. But thankfully, there's a shit ton of redeeming games that bail the genre out too. Doom as a game is an incredibly refreshing take on the FPS genre, making it as fast-paced as humanly possible. Then there's Titanfall 2, a game that's unfortunately never going to get a sequel. But the movement in that game combined with everything that already makes Call of Duty cool makes for one of the most incredibly slept-on FPS games to ever exist. And you know, as horrible as the current Battlefield game is, usually they kind of all suck at launch, and then right before the game's lifespan is over, they get shaped into something actually really good. So as a genre, FPS games have become the generic McDonald's of game genres, but some devs truly show how high the potential of the genre is, rounding this out to a B tier.
Well, get ready to hear me glaze the absolute shit out of the final genre I saved for last, Souls Likes. In my opinion, Bloodborne is a top 5 game ever made. In fact, I put it at number 1 in my top 25, even though I probably wouldn't do that today. My point is that these games are fucking incredible. And let me make an interesting case. Souls Likes fundamentally aren't even good games. The movement is generic, the way you attack things is unbelievably simple and unrefined. And on top of that, the exploration mechanics aren't anything special. But the writing in these games, the ridiculously well-designed bosses, the vague storytelling, that's what makes these games so great. Being a Souls-like does nothing inherently for a game, but it allows a game dev to paint their vision perfectly. Souls-likes with a clear vision are incredible games. Souls-likes without a clear vision are mediocre at best, and as a genre, in my opinion, it should be reserved for only the best game devs in the world. The ability to make an average combat system feel so incredibly satisfying, in my opinion, is a work of art. If you dislike Souls-likes, it's probably because you aren't a fan of the difficulty spikes. But if that's not the case for you, I really don't get what you could possibly dislike about the genre. S tier for me, no question. Well there we have it, a nice, beautiful, and weirdly even tier list in terms of distribution. Literally could not have turned out better. Anyway, at the end of my previous video, I asked for a few questions, so let's go over a couple of them. Question 1. I know that you mentioned in a previous video that you were in school and were taking time off for minor surgery. What are you studying? Well, I planned to study psychology. Um, I've always had an, uh, a very big fascination with it, um, and I still do, I still love it. But I kind of realized that making something that's just a passion into a career isn't always a great idea, um, which hilariously I'm trying to do with YouTube actually. I just kind of realized that I'm not really in the mood to be a student for another 8 years, and I like doing so much more, it's more fulfilling in my eyes, and I have no plans to finish out my degree. In fact, um, I plan to drop out at the nearest possible chance, and I plan to continue my full-time job that I have currently and then do this you know YouTube stuff part-time not really part-time I, I actually probably work like a net hundred hours a week and then once YouTube takes over this will just kind of be my full-time thing hope that answers your question have you ever considered opening a patreon or ko-fi account in the meantime um yeah I, I definitely have. I just can't conceptually think of enough to really support having a um, having a Patreon. Um, the most I could realistically do would be early releases, um, potentially doing like a like a more in-depth like uh, look at my back end for producing a video, just kind of showing my process for editing, script writing, um, and even just showing like sneak peeks of what I'm working on, throwing out ideas, thumbnails, all that sort of stuff. But if I were to do a Patreon, I would want it to be something that I would personally feel willing to subscribe to, and I don't see many Patreon that I think I ever would be. And then the things that I think I would be willing to pay for would be like access to like an exclusive discord and then potentially even like the ability to talk one-on-one -on -one with me. But if I were to do that, I feel like I would be swamped and I would have no time and I feel like it's just not a good way to go um, engaging in parasocial relationships. So at the moment, I don't really see a way that I could justify a Patreon or a Ko-Fi or anything like that. Um, if you have any suggestions for stuff I could do for something like that, um, please leave them down below. I will listen to it and see if I can cook up something that would be worth subscribing to. But at the moment, no plans. What is your taste in music? Um, I love... I love just about everything. Uh, I used to be one of those people who said everything but country, but even these days I'm sort of coming around to it. Um, just to give you a quick, like, top three bands, I would say something like Pink Floyd, Alice in Chains, and then like Kendrick Lamar. I like um, I like more introspective music, and I'm also an album person over a singles person. Seriously, there are almost no genres that I just straight up dislike. There's a lot of bands I dislike, and even popular bands I dislike. If you want to talk about music hot takes, dude, whew, I can get in some trouble with those. In fact, I'll give you one for free. I think Nirvana fucking sucks. I think Nirvana is the weakest grunge band out there. Nirvana was so overrated. Why would you listen to Nirvana when you have, like, Alice in Chains, dude? I don't get it. But yeah, that's gonna do it for questions. Make sure you leave more down below for me. But as far as today goes, that's gonna do it for me. Make sure you guys go follow me on Twitter. I wanna be more active there and talk. Um, I've kinda thrown a few things out, but, um, it's kinda hard to justify tweeting to such a small audience, so once I build it up more, I'm gonna start tweeting. Pretty often sharing some, some behind-the-scenes stuff, just kind of trying to engage with you guys a bit more. But anyway, you all know the deal. Any and all support would be amazing, but no one can force you, and I will see you all in the next one.